Hello and welcome to Season 5, Episode 23 of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Christina Hagen, coming to you live from Cape Town. We have over 160 episodes recorded and available on YouTube, so if you've missed out on any episodes, you can always catch up on our YouTube channel. Please do remember to like and subscribe to receive updates as and when we post. We are also on all major social media channels, and you can use the hashtag Conservation Conversations to let us know what you think of the show. As our regular viewers know, we aim to keep these webinars free for all to learn and enjoy. So if you do enjoy the series and can contribute no matter how small an amount, please do consider donating. You can donate through the BirdLife South Africa webpage at the link on the screen, or you can scan the QR code, which will take you there. Otherwise, you can EFT BirdLife South Africa directly and use the reference webinars and your name. And we're so grateful to those of you who continue to support our webinars. Now we have a special request from Lance Robinson, uh, who may be well known to many of you, especially those in Gauteng, uh, but Lance is doing his MSc project on AV tourism and needs your help in completing a survey. It doesn't take very long at all. Oops, sorry. It doesn't take very long at all. So please do scan the QR code. Otherwise I'll post the link in the chat box. Uh, shortly and please do go and take part in the survey. And now there are still some berths available on the ship for Flock to Marion again, so don't miss out on this amazing trip down into the southern ocean which gives you the opportunity to see some truly incredible birds. So please do join us for that and you can go to the BirdLife South Africa website and learn more and book as well. So now we, we have a special guest who will be no stranger to regular viewers. Uh, Andrew de Bloch of, was, of course, one of the hosts of Conservation Conversations. He is now an MP for the Democratic Alliance, but he joined us tonight to talk about uh, a different but exciting development. So Andrew, please yeah, tell us about your, your project. Thanks, Christina. Uh, I first want to say hello to everyone. This feels like a reunion. It's so great to be back with all of you. I've had one or two episodes where I've been in the audience, but uh, being back on as a, not a host, but a panelist, I guess, is is quite special. Um, so it's great to not see all of you, but be able to engage with all of you. It's fun to see some very familiar names popping up in the chat box. And uh, yeah, apart from uh, moving out of conservation into politics, uh, I have some other exciting news, which is something that I started while I was still at BirdLife, uh, but these things take a while to come to fruition. Um, I published a book. So this is my children's book, which is called The, the Twin South African Bird Tour. Uh, it was an idea I had, like I said, while I was still at BirdLife and, and thinking about how to get young people in South Africa enthused and excited about diversity. Um, obviously, I'm passionate about natural heritage and diversity of natural heritage, but also our cultural heritage, because we are, I mean, diversity is just synonymous with South Africa. So I had an idea of, of maybe how to do this, and I approached a publisher, and they said, let's run with it. And this is the product. So I'd love to introduce it to you. And uh, as you'll see at the end of the slides, um, we're going to do a little bit of a, a joint collab with BirdLife around us. So it's about these two twins, uh, Andy and Nandi, as you can see on screen here. Uh, they live in Joburg, but they are desperate to get out and see all of South Africa's birds that they've read about in their book. Um, next slide. And eventually they win a competition with BirdLife South Africa to uh, go on a bus tour around the country. And they meet all these different birds and they go to all these different landscapes all over the country. And uh, yeah, you can go to the next slide. They um, meet these birds and, and each different bird is a is a, an emblem or an icon of a different cultural and language group in South Africa. So you can see here, uh, for example, the ground hornbill is a is a symbol for the uh, Tsonga people or, or Shangan people. Uh, and this spread is focused on Kruger, but also the mythology of how the ground hornbill brings the rain. You'll see it's a very dramatic storm sequence in the background there. Um, you get the Narina Trogon for the Sepedi and Setswana uh, speakers um, and they, they go across the country like a, 
a different bird for every single official language in South Africa, except for sign language, because I wasn't creative enough to work out how to do that in a visual book for kids. But uh, yeah, go to the next slide. I don't know how much of Sage's time, but the book is for kids between the ages of five and 10 or so, depending on whether they're being read to or, or reading it themselves. Um, there've been younger kids who love the visual imagery and there've been older kids who like uh, learning about it. Um, I even gave a copy to the uh, Minister for Basic Education and she said I taught her a few things about birds in South Africa and our, our cultural ties to birds uh, in our wonderful country. So it's really for young and old. It's a great Christmas present. Uh, we're at that sort of time of year, which is absolutely terrifying. How did this year just disappear? Um, but we are having a book launch with Bird Life South Africa. So like I said, this book is something I started while I was still there. Um, even on the inside of the, the cover, which I'll just show you there quickly, um, is a little pamphlet uh, encouraging people, young and old, to join BirdLife South Africa. So I still like to support the organization. Uh, it's been um, endorsed by BirdLife South Africa as well, and it's being sold in the BirdLife South Africa store. And we're doing an official launch at BirdLife South Africa's offices in Johannesburg on the 23rd of November. Uh, we're going to do a signing, uh, a bit of a reading, um, there'll also be a little bit of a competition around it, maybe a giveaway or two, who knows what might happen. Uh, so if you can come join us on the 23rd of November, 9.30 for 10 o'clock. And then my last slide is just to say that you can buy the book now on the Bird Life South Africa store. Um, I've gone into the, the shop at Isdal House and I've signed a bunch of copies. So if you get there quickly on the order, you might pick up a signed copy. I might have to go in and and assign a few more if Claire runs out, but she will no doubt let me know. Um, like I say, it's, it's a wonderful gift for people. Um, and I think we can all resonate with the message of celebrating South Africa's birds, South Africa's nature, and our diversity of wonderful people as well. So that's my message. Thank you for the support. Um, and like I say, it's great to be online with all of you guys. And Sage, I cannot wait to hear your presentation. Great. Yeah. Thanks very much for that, Andrew. It's, it is it is an incredible book. I've got one uh, that will be going to my niece um, for her birthday um, later, later um, in November. So yeah, I've, it's, a, it's a really great book and it ties in quite nicely with, with Sage's work, I think, to try and um, expand the, the, the cultural significance of birds to more people. So um, it was good timing <laughs> that uh, you came on this evening. But yeah, thanks very much for introducing your special uh, project to us. Tonight's main event, we have um, Sage Naidu joining us. Uh, Sage is currently an MSc student at uh, Wits University, and his research interests lie within the fields of ornithology and urban ecology, and specifically how understanding, uh, understanding how birds interact and respond to these novel environments. So Sage has been interested in birds from a young age and has build, been building towards um, a research profile that highlights the value of birds to our environment. He uh, has an honors pro uh, degree, which looked at the effects of South Africa's urban development on sparrow morphology. And uh, now his MSc is focusing on understanding how and why perceptions and values of birds uh, may vary uh, with urban and socioeconomic landscapes. So Sage, we are very happy to have you on the show. And uh, yeah, please start sharing your screen and uh, take it away. Um, thank you so much, Christina. Um, is it? Yes. Uh, okay. 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 So thank you so much, Christina, the Conservation Conversations team and BirdLife South Africa having me here tonight. It is a great pleasure to be able to share my research with you and hopefully highlight some key discussions surrounding birds and how our landscapes are affecting our access to these magnificent creatures. Um, today, over half of the world's, uh, over the half of the world's populations occupy urban regions, with this number expected to increase to about 70% in the year 2050. This rapid urbanization, however, isn't just changing the landscape. It's reshaping our ecosystems, altering our climate systems, and transforming how we as humans are interacting with nature. And as these urban settlements continue to expand, we face a pressing question of how we can continue to grow sustainably 
while balancing our needs of the people, nature, and the environment. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Avian Cultural Ecosystem Services Project, a research project by myself and Siobhan Reynolds. It is known that increasing urbanization is threatening global biodiversity by causing both animal and vegetation populations to decline. From an urban population perspective, this is also causing decreases in human nature connections and human nature interactions, manifesting itself as what is known as an extinction of experience as fewer people interact with and experience nature in these developing urban systems. In particular, with increased urban developments, the extinction of experience is particularly prevalent within our younger generations, especially kids who are growing up in these urban areas with limited access to nature. So there are few people now that live in areas where they can easily access environments that have these natural elements for kids to go out and play in, resulting in fewer of these children being able to experience and interact with nature, causing their values and perceptions of nature to decrease. The patterns of the extinction of experience can further be substantiated by the luxury effect, which is the global phenomenon that explains that as we move along socioeconomic gradients that are mediated by urban cover, the levels and types of biodiversity that we are exposed to will vary, in particular highlighting that low-income landscapes tend to have lower accessibility or lower levels of biodiversity than our high income landscapes. And this might be a factor of the fact that low income landscapes tend to have overall lower biodiversity due to landscape management practices, as well as the allocation of government resources. But what this is telling us is that there's potentially a greater extinction of experience that exists within these low income communities. So the question you might be asking yourself today is, why does this matter? And my answer to that is simple. With the general extinction of experience existing within these communities and causing biodiversity to decrease, a major consequence that we are observing is a possible loss of ecosystem services. Now, ecosystem services are the benefits that nature provides us and can be categorized into four main groups, namely provisioning services such as food and water, regulating services such as flood mitigation or pollination, supporting services such as nutrient cycling or habitat creation, and cultural services such as aesthetic values or emotional connections towards nature. Now, as our title suggests, we specifically focused on cultural ecosystem services, which is typically the hardest ecosystem service type to quantify. Cultural ecosystem services can be defined as the intangible benefits that we as humans are deriving from our natural environments towards improving our mental and physical well-being. And this may be through aspects of the aesthetic values, spiritual values, or the emotional connections that we are forming towards nature. Now, for avid birders, such as many of you here tonight, this may not seem like a major issue as we constantly get to put ourselves in the path of nature when we go birding. But for many others who don't actively go outdoors or who don't have much access to natural environments on a daily basis, a loss of biodiversity is certainly posing a major threat to their cultural ecosystem service acceptability. So there have been several studies that have attempted to quantify cultural ecosystem services across different landscapes. But despite this, literature remains largely limited. And this can be due to two factors. The first is due to a lack of a standardized metric to quantify cultural ecosystem services across different landscape types. And the second is due to the large complexity that is associated with cultural ecosystem services, specifically due to its roots within individual perceptions and individual values. So it's possible that no two people could have the same cultural values for the same natural resource. Despite this, there have been studies that have been conducted attempting to quantify cultural ecosystem services by specifically focusing on specific taxa. For example, what I'm showing on the slide now is an example that, of a study that looked at birds within an urban context. And what the study found is that in general, birds are a well-liked and well-valued taxon specifically linked to cultural ecosystem services that they offer. So this includes factors such as their aesthetic values, their pest control habits, providing spiritual values, as well as their educational value. 
The issue with such literature, however, is that it pertains largely to perceptions of individuals that live in global North regions, rather than a global perspective overall. There's also a landscape bias that we need to consider from these studies, where most, if not all, existing studies have focused solely on singular urban areas and singular urban suburbs that are generally more affluent in nature, suggesting that we don't understand how the full urban to socioeconomic gradients may be influencing access to these avian cultural ecosystem services or ecosystem services in general for different communities. Hence, for our study, we developed a twofold goal, with the first part being to quantify the cultural ecosystem services provided by birds in South Africa, and the second being to determine the access to avian cultural ecosystem services along our urban and socioeconomic gradients in the country. And to address this, we opted to focus at a more broad scale by looking at the country level, targeting four South African provinces that house our four main city hubs, namely Johannesburg and Pretoria together, Cape Town, Bloemfontein, and then Durban. And due to this country level focus, we of course needed to select study species that were reflective of South Africa's diverse avifauna. And to achieve this, we turned to the SABAP2 or the Southern African Bird Atlas Project 2 to aid us in selecting the study species that we looked at. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the SABAP2 project, it is an ongoing citizen science project that collects data on the distribution of bird species across Southern African landscapes within these five by five minutes latitudinal and longitudinal grid cells known as PENSADs. So here I have a map showing the sampling that has been conducted by the SABAP2 project, showing a gridded PENSAD map of the number of cards which is the method that they use to collect data across these regions, across Southern African landscapes. And what these cards, these pen sets and colors are showing on this map is essentially the number of cards that have been submitted for different regions, where a yellow color indicates fewer cards having been submitted and a purple color indicating more cards have been submitted and therefore more sampling has taken place. I would just like to pause here for a moment and just say thank you to the Sabat 2 atlases for their valiant efforts in contributing and towards this data set and helping to collect this data, allowing for such research to happen. Because without you, there's a lot of research that may not be able to be conducted in our country. But on that note, I'd like to refocus on what our story is telling us. And again, focusing on the selection of our study species, to select our study species, we selected a random pen set that was highly sampled in the region surrounding the four city hubs that we focused on. So for example, shown here, we looked at the purple pen sets around Johannesburg and randomly selected one of these to aid us in selecting our species. And this is an example of the pen set that we used to select our study species in the Johannesburg region. And from this pen set, we accessed the table of the species that were assessed or observed within this pen set and use the reporting rates for the different species, which is essentially a frequency of the records of observations of these different species within the pen set to randomly select 13 species on a rare to common occurrence gradient within this province or within the city region. And this is a process that we repeated for all four provinces to select our study species. And in total, we selected 36 species that were included in our analysis. And this included both native and invasive species, as well as accounted for 11 species that were assessed across more than one of our study provinces. And due to the number of species, it was kind of unfeasible for me to include all of their names on the slides. But if you are keen to know more about these birds, you can feel free to ask me about that during the Q&A se session. Now, with our study species selected, we could set out to collect our data, and we did this by creating and distributing research questionnaires in Google Forms. And these were questionnaires that we distributed online via numerous social media platforms, as well as through the assistance of numerous organizations, companies, groups, and individuals. And while I will go through more detail on specific questions that we ask in the questionnaire, the key purpose of our questionnaire was to highlight 
and identify the likability of different bird species across South Africa and to understand why different people or different individuals may be perceiving or valuing different birds in their environments. And before I get into the specifics, I just want to recognize the response that we received to our research questionnaires. In total, we received a number of a total of 1,994 responses, which is a very fitting number for the country of South Africa, with most of our responses coming from people living in the Gauteng province and the fewest responses coming from the free state. I would just like to say thank you to each and every one of our respondents that contributed towards our data sets, because without you, we would not have been able to complete the study and our study would not have been as great of a success that it is. And on that note, we can now get into the crux of things and see what we actually did with this data and what we found from this data, starting with part one, which was quantifying the cultural ecosystem services of birds in South Africa. And for this part of our study, the aim was to produce both a quantitative and a qualitative assessment of avian cultural ecosystem services by using likability scores and the perspective reasons for likability of birds as rated by our questionnaire respondents. And so for our quantitative assessment, we derived scores of species likability from the ratings that people provided for different bird species. And one of our questions was therefore, having people rate the appeal of different bird species on a five point Likert scale, where one indicated no appeal for a bird and five indicated very high appeal for the bird. Now, the only information that we provided to our respondents for in these questions was the common name of the species, as well as a single full color image of the species, ensuring that the ratings that individuals gave could be based on any personal experiences or any personal understandings of the species of the individual answering the questionnaire themselves. And on the slide here, what I'm showing is how this question was set up for as an example of one of our species, which was the spotted eagle owl included in our Johannesburg questionnaire. And if you aren't keen, I do invite you to leave your responses for the species in the comment box, just saying what out of five you would rate this bird and maybe why you would rate this bird that number, just to see how this data collection worked. And you can see sort of the variation in people's responses as to whether they like the species and why they like the species. For me personally, this is a species that I would give five out of five, as it is one of my favorite species that I have some really good personal experiences with. I mean, he has a 12 year old version of me that got to experience a uh, spotted eagle owl up close. And in general, I just love the species majestic and majestic aura, as well as its uh, mysterious aspects that are associated with this bird. Now, if we look at some of the results that we got from this likability data, the figure that I'm showing on the slide now is just a heat map of the average likability that we received for each species that we analyzed for the provinces that they were assessed in. I will be zooming into this figure soon, but what I want to highlight here is that there is variation in the likability of the different species as you can see by the different shades of green, where darker shades of green indicate higher likability and lighter shades of green indicate a lower likability. And this is just showing that there are some species that are tend to be more well-liked than others. For example, the highest rated species from our, from our questionnaire was the Malachite Kingfisher, which received 4.9 out of 5. On the opposite side of the spectrum, the common minor was our lowest rated species, receiving 2.5 out of 5. And because I know a lot of people will be interested, we can see that the Hardy the Ibis received a middle ground rating with about 3.5 out of 5. But what these patterns are highlighting to us is that our more characteristic species, so our more small birds or colorful species, received higher likability scores than our pest-like or invasive species in the country. Now, if we zoom into this figure and focus on the first 11 species, these are the 11 species that I mentioned previously that were assessed in more than one of our provincial study regions. And what I want to highlight specifically on this figure here 
is that there is some variation and significant differences in the likability scores received for the same species by individuals living in different provinces. So, for example, the likability of the African Harrier hawk was significantly higher in KwaZulu Natal compared to Jahan or to, compared to Gauteng, and the Egyptian goose was significantly more liked in Gauteng compared to the Western Cape. While I haven't teased apart the exact reasoning for this yet, it may be associated with the distribution of these species in these different landscapes, where it may be more prevalent in one landscape than the other, resulting in greater experiences for different individuals, hence higher likability for the species. Following our quantitative assessment, we then did a qualitative assessment to dissect why people like these bird species. And this was achieved through a follow-up open-ended question where respondents could, in their own words, say why they rated the species appeal in the way that they did. And just briefly, here are some of the examples of the responses we received for the spotted eagle owl, showing us that they are either well-liked based on their appearances or their ecological roles, such as pest control, or maybe slightly less liked due to some behavioral habits, such as predating on specific species, such as this person mentioning bush babies, or they might not be liked at all by some people due to their cultural connotations. Another example that I want to highlight is, of course, the Hadida Ibis again, which is our national alarm clock, as many people know. And if you recall from the previous slide, the likability of the species was sort of in the middle ground. And we, if we look at the reasons that people gave, we can sort of understand why it received this middle ground rating. Specifically, we can see that there's variation in the responses, with some people showing that they really love the species based on its aesthetic appeals, or based on the significance that the species has in representing South Africa as a country, with a lot of people actually recognizing this more as our national bird species than the blue crane, ironically. But there's also the other side of the spectrum where some people don't like the species due to annoying habits, such as it being noisy or messy. Now, despite this, so we did receive a lot of these responses. Due to the nature of the questionnaires, i.e. we had 36 different species, as well as a total of 1,994 responses to our questionnaires. This meant we received a total of approximately 71,784 open-ended responses as to why people liked different bird species, or maybe did not like specific bird species. And due to this number, a manual assessment to qualify different themes of likability for these bird species was logically unfeasible. And on top of that, existing programs for these type of sentiment analysis may not have been feasible. As such, we decided to take a unique route and turn to our trusty friend of ChatGPT to aid us with a thematic categorization of the respondent perceptions of bird likability. And this process involved providing the ChatGPT program with open-ended responses and essentially prompting and training ChatGPT to identify and categorize these responses into major themes of likability. But this was no easy feat and there were some challenges that needed to be troubleshooted. Specifically, we found that there was a categorization error rate of 15.13%. And this accounted for some of the open-ended responses either being miscategorized or not categorized at all. And what we noted for the reason behind this was that it was associated with variations in our respondents' response to the specific question, as well as ChatGPT's inability to identify certain emotional contexts associated with responses. For example, if we're looking at the variation in responses, we can consider the great go-away bird, which is characteristically known for the great crest of feathers that it has on its head. Now, many different people use different terms to describe this crest as a feature that they liked, using words such as mohawk or mane or even the word cape. But on top of using different words, there was also some variations or misspellings of these words. Hence, myself and ChatGPT weren't able to account for variations in these responses and the different terms that people may use, resulting in some of these responses not being categorized. On the emotional context side of things, 
What we notice is ChatGPT struggles with both simple and complex emotional responses. So some emotional responses that I as a human can identify was not identified by ChatGPT. And what I show on the slide here is two examples of that. So a person could say, it is a fish eagle or I love raptors. And I as a human can tell that that is a response based in emotion. But ChatGPT is unable to recognize that and did not categorize these types of responses correctly. Additionally, there were more complex responses as well, where some people use metaphors to describe specific behaviors and ChatGPT wasn't able to use this or identify this when thematically categorizing the data. And so the only solution was for me to go in and manually categorize these miscategorized, sorry, these miscategorized responses into the themes identified by ChatGPT. And speaking of those themes, these are the eight themes that ChatGPT identified to describe or quantify what the major themes of likability are for birds in South Africa. And this ranges from several factors, such as the beauty and appearance of birds, or specific odd be behaviors and vocalization patterns, or even some negative behaviors that may have influenced how people perceive different bird species. And here is a heat map that shows sort of the ranking of these different themes for the different bird species, according to which themes were more prevalent in describing why people perceived specific birds in their environment. So were they being, was the perception of the bird more strongly influenced by people seeing them for their aesthetic values and emotional effect? Or was it based on certain negative or neutral responses from the birds? And if we zoom in onto this figure and take a closer look at a selection of the species, we can see that the ranking of these likability themes do vary between different species. But in general, what we can note is that aesthetics and appearance and emotional impact tended to be the highest ranked um, theme of likability for most species, with cultural significance and symbolism generally ranking the lowest, indicating that maybe cultural significance isn't a strong predictor or influential factor when people decide why they like or don't like specific bird species. And then from this, we then set out to create thematic bundles using ChatGPT's themes of these ecosystem services by bundling and grouping these into bundle into sorry into themes of similar nature. And this was done using a factor analysis in R Studio. And what we can see from this factor analysis is that three bundles of cultural ecosystem services was identified using these themes identified by ChatGPT, representing groupings of the themes in bundles with a similar thematic nature. What is important to note here, if you see the different themes and how they fall into the different bundles, is that this was not mutually exclusive. So a single theme could fall into more than one of these thematic bundles. And the three bundles that were identified was firstly, an ecological and environmental impact bundle, that is associated with the role of the bird in the environment. The second is a cultural and emotional resonance bundle that shows the values and personal connections to the bird. And the third bundle was a behavioral and aesthetic appeal bundle that is based on how the bird acts or how the bird looks. And using these bundles, we then want to assess whether species are appreciated for a specific set of cultural ecosystem services to either one of these bundles, or if they had appreciation and their perception being driven by multidimensional services, so more than one bundle at the same time. And that is what I'm going to be showing here with this figure on the shot, on the slide currently. But before I add in the data, I want to make clear what this graph is showing. So what we were looking at here was to assess if the 36 species perception was being driven solely by a cultural and emotional resonance factor, or solely by an ecological and environmental impact factor, or a synergy between both. So if the birds fall into the upper left red quadrant, this means that it is more strongly, its perception is more strongly associated with its cultural values. 
if it falls into the lower right red quadrant, then it is associated with only its ecological and environmental impact. But if it falls into the upper blue quadrant, then it is associated with a synergy between both of these factors. And a key point to highlight here is that if a species falls into any of these segments, it doesn't indicate particularly just a positive response, but more so a strong association in that particular factor direction. And this is what it looks like when we add in the data onto this figure. And we can see that the species are kind of randomly distributed across this um, mapping. And to understand this better, I'm going to walk through a couple of examples to explain what I'm trying to break down here. So the first species that we're going to look at is the African fish eagle, which we can see falls into that upper left red quadrant. And what this is showing us is that the perception of the species is solely strongly associated with its cultural and emotional resonance, with its ecological and environmental impact not having influenced how people value this bird. On the other hand, if we look at the Egyptian goose, which falls into the lower red quadrant, we can see that and say that its perception was strongly associated with its ecological and environmental impact, but not with its cultural and emotional resonance. And lastly, we can look at the pied crow, which falls into that synergy factor bundle, which shows that its perception is strongly associated with the synergy between both its cultural and emotional resonance, as well as its ecological and environmental impact. And this was based on the data largely through a negative lens. Sorry. And so from this part of our study, the main conclusions that I want to show here is that, yes, birds are a well-liked and well-valued taxon in urban regions of South Africa, but these levels of likability can vary by species. Additionally, the reasons for likability can vary and while it was broadly conserved to the eight major themes that ChatGPT identified, we do still confirm that cultural ecosystem services are highly complex, with some species being simply liked for singular service provisions, whereas others were liked or valued for the offering of multidimensional or multiple services at the same time. And so that brings us to a wrap on part one of the study and opens the door to look into part two and the second part of the ACES project. And for this part of our study, the aim was to generate and map a novel index of avian cultural ecosystem services to evaluate how access to these service types varied along urban and socioeconomic gradients of South Africa. And to do this, we used the likability data that we got from part one of the study, but we also had a more strong focus on the geographic locations of our respondents to aid in a spatial assessment of these responses across South Africa. And so this was quite a complex process. So I'm first going to break down what we did for this part with a flowchart before I go into the details of each step. And as I mentioned, the primary goal of this part of our study was to develop a novel index to aid in quantifying the cultural ecosystem services that are provided by birds. And to do this, we needed two components of data. The first being the likability data that we had from part one of the study. And the second is a biodiversity abundance measure that we could use to calculate the novel index so that it represented both how likable different species were, as well as where the species occur within our landscapes. And on that note, I did mention that we wanted to do a landscape analysis. And so we needed metrics of the urban cover gradients, as well as the socioeconomic status, to see how access to these services may vary or differ along urban and socioeconomic gradients of South Africa. And now, based on this breakdown, we can move into understanding the details behind some of these factors. And since I explained explicitly how we got the likability data in part one, I'm going to focus more on understanding how we got the biodiversity metric for our cultural ecosystem services index. 
Specifically, we wanted a measure that represented the probability of species occurrence across different landscapes to account for the manner in which different bird species are distributed across South African landscapes, as well as, therefore, accounting for the subsequent distribution of their cultural ecosystem services. And to do this, we used data from the SAVAP2 project, specifically data on the presence or absence of birds within different landscapes, to conduct an occupancy model to determine the best predictors of avian species distribution for each of our 36 different species. In particular, we looked at temperature and precipitation, as well as combination between these factors to determine which factor, which variables were more influential in driving the distribution of each of our 36 study species. And from that, we were able to get a measure of the probability of species occurrence across urban and socioeconomic landscapes. Here is an example map of the distribution and the probability of species occurrence of the hardy dot ibis within urban and socioeconomic landscapes of our four study provinces. And what we can see from this map is that in general, the hardy dot has high probability of occurrence within South African urban landscapes. And so using this data, so the likability data from part one, and this probability of occurrence measure that we calculated with the SABAP2 data, we could calculate our novel cultural ecosystem services index by multiplying the two values together. And this provided us the basis to test and assess if urban and socioeconomic landscapes affect accessibility to these service types. And on that note, it is important for us to define first what our urban and socioeconomic landscapes were. And for our urban landscape, we used the South African National Land Cover Data Set for 2020 to identify all regions within our four study provinces with greater than 1% urban cover to serve as a metric of our urban cover gradients. And this is what that looks like mapped out spatially across our four study regions, where we can see variation in urban cover levels with a darker shade indicating higher levels of urban cover and a lighter shade indicating lower levels of urban cover. For our socioeconomic variable, we use a property value approach as updated census data was not available to us at the time. Hence, we used property 24 to extract the cost of two bedroom houses along that identified urban gradient to serve as a metric of the socioeconomic status. And this is what that looks like mapped out spatially. As you can see here, there's a large scale ranging from 500,000 to 10 million rand. And because of this large scale, a lot of the variation in the socioeconomic metric is actually hidden within the one to two million rand range, which is why it doesn't look as visually varied as it actually is in South Africa. And using these two gradients, we were then able to map out where our cultural ecosystem services index lied along these landscapes. And what we are able to highlight is that there is variations in the levels of accessibility to avian cultural ecosystem services, ranging from zero to 65, as well as noting that there is variation in the distribution of access to these services across different landscapes. So we can see that there is generally high levels of accessibility to these services along some of the regions. So for example, there is a dark band along the coast of KwaZulu-Natal. Whereas if we compare that to Gauteng, we can see there's generally little to no variation in the spread of our avian cultural ecosystem services index. And because of this, we want to test this statistically to determine if there is indeed a landscape effect on access to these service types. And so we generated a general linear model to test the additive and interactive effects of our urban and socioeconomic landscapes on the cultural ecosystem services index. And from this, we were able to confirm that there is indeed a clear luxury effect on access to avian cultural ecosystem services within South Africa. Specifically, what this graph is showing is that there's a positive correlation between our socioeconomic variable and our cultural ecosystem services index suggesting that our high income landscapes have higher accessibility to avian cultural ecosystem services than our low income landscapes. 
But this is, of course, more complicated and nuanced when we consider the mediation by the urban cover gradient, which specifically is showing us that within our low income landscapes, irrespective of changes to the urban cover gradients, your access to avian coastal ecosystem services remains consistently low. And from this part of the study, the two main takeaways is that there is indeed a strong luxury effect that is showing us that our low income landscapes have lower accessibility to avian coastal ecosystem services. The second point is that due to the overall lower biodiversity that is associated with low income landscapes, as well as the factor that the biodiversity that tends to be available within these landscapes tends to be of lower quality and lower likability, there's possibly a stronger extinction of experience that exists within South Africa's low income landscapes. Now, before I conclude what the key takeaway message of our study is, it is important to note some limitations that are linked to the likability data of our study. Specifically, due to the online distribution of our research questionnaires, which was largely accessible only to residents that live within our urban city centers and our urban suburbs, but not to our low income landscapes, as well as noting that there was a large bias in our likability data towards the white demographic of South Africa. It may be thought that our metric may not be as representative as we want to be. But despite this limitation, by incorporating a biodiversity metric using the SABAP data, we were able to mediate some of these, these biases and limitations by accounting for the distribution of these species across varied landscapes, and therefore accounting for what ecosystem service types different communities may have access to. And if we wanted to, lim to reduce these limitations, it would require us to go and further expand on the study by doing more groundwork and actually going into the low income landscapes to understand why or how they like specific bird species that exist within the landscape. And on that note, the main takeaway message that I want to highlight based on our study findings and our study patterns is that access to avian cultural ecosystem services is highlighting key environmental injustices that are linked to distributional biases of birds and their ecosystem services. So for example, high income landscapes can encourage an increase in biodiversity by developing their ecosystems with the incorporation of green spaces and gardens that provide habitats that will encourage more diverse bird populations. And this is of course a luxury that may not be available to most low income landscapes. Hence, one of the, hence we are suggesting that one of the only ways to target and mitigate these patterns is to specifically target the socioeconomic imbalances that exist across our country's landscapes, which is of course no easy feat. But one possible solution may be to implement urban greening strategies across these landscapes to introduce more vegetated habitats that species could occupy. But what our, our study results is specifically highlighting is that our focus really needs to be on targeting low income landscapes specifically with these approaches, rather than focusing across all landscape types broadly. And this will help us to reduce those environmental injustices and the socioeconomic imbalances that exist in our country. And that note, I would like to just say thank you. And of course, it goes without saying that it took an army to get the study together. And I'm unfortunately able to thank each and every individual that helped with the study because it would take me an additional three hours, which I don't have. But I would just like to once again say thank you to every single individual organization, group and person that helped with the study in any way, whether it was answering our questionnaires or helping to distribute our, our questionnaires more broadly it really helps ensure that we were able to bring the study together and provide our results. But on that note, there is one person that really needs to be recognized, which is my phenomenal supervisor, Siobhan Reynolds, without whom the study would not have been as successful as it was. And to you, Siobhan, I am eternally grateful. Thank you.
Great. Thanks so much, Sage. That was a, a great presentation. And you, yeah, you explained your, your research so clearly and so well. So thank you very much for sharing uh, what you've been working on. Um, you can see from all the lovely little emojis, you can't hear the applause, but um, <laughs> there's lots of it coming through. Definitely. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> so um, there are a few questions coming in in the Q&A box. And uh, so please do keep them coming in there. And uh, just to note, rather put them in the Q&A box, not the chat box, um, as it's very difficult for me to keep track of them in the, in the chat. Um, yeah, so just briefly before we get on to the questions, as I know some people may need to leave, uh, just a reminder that we'll, we'll be back again in two weeks time with another Conservation Conversations, and this time it will be from Re Rebecca Muller giving um, some insights into her work on uh, changes to bird breeding uh, patterns. Okay, so Sage, on to some questions. Um, the first one from Helen uh, asking, was there any criteria used for determining the likability, um, e.g. brightly colored songs, common, etc.? So did you give people guidance in sort of what was, what likability meant? Um, so to answer that question, no, we didn't give any criteria at all to sort of influence or induce any bias as to how people like the birds. So for our likability ratings, we wanted to be we wanted it to be specifically based on the individual's perception of the bird itself, which is why the only information we provided in our questionnaire was just the uh, common name of the species and a single color picture. So the picture ensured that you could see the different patterns and colors associated with the bird but it wasn't meant to be something that influenced why or why you didn't like the bird. That was meant to be more so based on any personal understanding or experiences you may have had with species. Okay, great. And then there's a question from Michael um, saying, thanks for an interesting project and asking how representative were your questionnaire targets? Are you able to tell if the responses are from specific locations and for and or from avid birders? So there was definitely a large bias in our likability data, which I did bring up in our limitation slide. So it was, especially due to the distribution of the um, questionnaires. So with bird life aiding a lot in sending out our questionnaires, majority of our survey responses came from avid birders as opposed to the general public. But despite that, by distributing the survey broadly, we do have perspectives of people that weren't avid birders. But overall, I would say that the majority of our responses were biased towards people who are who identify as avid birders. Yeah, I think that's always going to be an issue because people who are more likely to answer a bird survey are are probably birders rather than the general public. But um, Absolutely. yeah, it was, it's yeah good to recognize the, the limitations and, and potential pitfalls and try and control for them as best you can, as you have. Uh, so a question from Ted um, asking, why was the African Harrier Hawk not included in the Western Cape analysis as they breed, occur and breed in, in Cape Town? Um, it, but the reason why it wasn't included was just based on our selection process. So we wanted it to be as random as possible. So when I went in and accessed the list of species within our randomly selected pentad, I wasn't specifically focusing on the species name in particular. I was more looking at the reporting rate. So I wanted species that were reported highly within that pentad as well as panther as species that were maybe not as highly reported so that we got a wide range of species from that great common occurrence gradient that I mentioned. So this is why the African Harrier Hawk may not have been present within our Western Cape survey. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, 
There's a question from an anonymous um, person saying, is it possible the main determining factor could be the gardens found in affluent areas? Like what role does that play? Absolutely. That could be a very large driving factor as to why affluent areas have higher accessibility. It plays into that whole aspect of affluent areas being able to create environments that encourage higher biodiversity. So by having these, by having more gardens as well as gardens that have more vegetation, it means that our affluent areas can encourage and support higher levels of biodiversity compared to our low income landscapes, which may have some gardens, but the gardens may not be as diverse. So it will only support fewer species. Mm, absolutely. Uh, so that now there are two questions um, that are kind of linked asking about environmental education. So first, uh, Peter Nelson says, excellent presentation. What do you see the role of traditional environmental education in making a difference going forward? And then linked to that, Penny is asking what specifically about um, what impact you think it education has, particularly, for example, the programs run by Joburg City Parks and Zoos? I think by encouraging education in general, we can help to try and understand why our landscapes are actually influencing the distribution of these species and the services. So if we can sort of encourage people to understand how our changing of these landscapes are affecting how different species can use the landscape, as well as sort of educate people on understanding how different socioeconomic situations may be influencing why they do or don't have certain levels of biodiversity. We can help in aiding to sort of mitigate that environmental injustices and socioeconomic imbalances by having people um, sort of become part of the conversation, if I can put it that way, by having them sort of um, be a part of the narrative as they get to better understand how changes to our landscapes are affecting essentially the distribution of different bird species in South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, so linked to that, Peter has asked a part two, uh, which you've kind of covered, so um, yeah. But basically saying, are there lessons from your research that can be taken on board by environmental education um, initiatives, you know, that to, to kind of improve them? I would definitely say that our study did provide, does provide some basis for lessons that we can learn. And essentially it is linked to just like, as I said before, encouraging and bringing together people and involving them in the conversation to understand um, how our landscapes affect these birds and cultural ecosystem services in general, and why we actually need to be focusing our efforts on the low income landscapes in particular. Mm, absolutely. Hopefully, um, some of your study will, will filter into the environmental education space. Um, another question from Michael saying, from your open-ended questions, was there any indication of awareness of ecosystem values or were the likability um, scores largely based on sentimental reasons? So there was definitely influences of or recognition of the ecological impacts of birds. So um, while I did mention that the top two ranked themes that ChatGPT identified were largely based on the appearance and the emotional aspects of birds. I would say in general, the third highest rank response is actually based on people admiring or acknowledging ecological impacts of these birds. So either providing uh, specific services towards creating habitats as well as like helping build the environment in itself, as well as like Noting from another perspective, there's also the acknowledgement of the negative behaviors of these birds in our environment. So people do recognize both the positive and negative ecological roles of birds when they were answering this open-ended question. Mm -hmm. 
it was just dependent on which species. So um, some species were definitely just purely liked based on their sentimental values. And this was in particular like our raptor species or the more colorful species so the Malachi kingfisher or the orange breast sunbird, for example. But there was definitely some of those species that had the ecological impacts coming more coming through more strongly as the reason why people perceived or valued these birds in the environment. Okay. It's good to know that people are recognizing the ecological value of birds. Um, now there's a question from Linda Nyambezi, who I see is on your list of support crew, um, <laughs> saying, was there anything in your results that surprised you? I would say not in particular surprising. I think going into the study, it was kind of not a known fact, but you would expect that access to these services would have been lower within the low income landscapes. Mm. But I would say probably the most surprising result for me was actually the likability scores received by the Harida because I genuinely thought that most people would have disliked the species. So I was actually genuinely surprised by the amount of people that actually rated this bird five out of five. So I think that would probably be the most surprising aspect that I found from our yeah. data, but the actual major findings weren't as surprising. Right, yeah, I'm also surprised at the Heidi Da. <laughs> um, but so obviously there are people out there who like them. <laughs> which is, is good. <laughs> yes, I mean, they do play an important role irrespective of some annoying habits, yes. I would say. <laughs> um, now we have just one question left and then we'll let you go. Um, so it's from Ronnie saying, can I still answer the questionnaire or am I too late? So where are you in your, um, in your MSc and yeah, can people still contribute to the study? Unfortunately, the questionnaire has been closed for response. Um, the MSc is actually coming to a close soon with me finalizing the write-up aspect and um, all of our results have been analyzed, so there isn't any room currently for us to be accepting new responses. Fair enough. Studies have to end at some point. Um, and I wish you all the best with the writing up. And yeah, that's always a, a difficult process. So wishing you all the best with that. Um, so we have uh, come to the end of the questions and we've come to just after eight o'clock. So I think we will close it off there. Thank you very much again, Sage, for your time this evening and sharing your, your very interesting work with us. And um, yeah, wishing you all the best with the rest of your MSc. Is there Anything that you would like to add as, as last words before we close? I would, just, I would just like to say thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to present my research. Um, it's a brilliant opportunity to be able to share like such important information that exists within our environments. And I'm really grateful to your team for having this type of webinar series where we can continue to see um, research based on conservation being updated constantly. So I'm very happy to be a part of this conversation. So thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of the talk today. You're very, very welcome. And it's great to be able to highlight some of the, the students who are uh, doing some really interesting work. So yeah, thank you very much. And so with that, I'll say thank you very much to all our viewers this evening. And please do join us again in two weeks time for another Conservation Conversations. Good night. Bye.